Hey everybody, welcome to episode 114 of the WP Roundtable. Today I'm joined by my good friend Kevin Skerritt of Flock Marketing. How are you doing this evening, Kevin? Hey Kyle, how's it going? It's going pretty good. I'm glad you could find your time to join us. Glad to be here. It's a real pleasure. Kevin's been someone whose work I've admired for quite a while. I think you do some pretty interesting things and have some great perspective on uh, some topics that we haven't talked about too often on this show. So we're gonna dive real deep into that. Before we do, we're gonna touch on our quick picks of the week real fast. For mine, I'm sharing a blog post that I read this morning by my good friend, Carrie Dills. She's a prominent member of the WordPress community, has her own podcast over on officehours.fm. And she wrote a post uh, today or yesterday about uh, some people being pretty vocal with their uh, criticisms and, and outrage over Managed WP being acquired by GoDaddy. And so apparently, uh, a lot of people had strong opinions and, and were getting all kinds of ragey on Twitter and Facebook and wherever else. And uh, she put it very nicely as well as I, or better than I could have myself that uh, there's, there's just no place for that. And that's not the kind of community that we want to be. And I really appreciated her insight as I always do. I'm really not a fan of the kind of people who want to just jump out and, and, and bash and, and criticize and, and make lots of blanket statements. And while big companies like GoDaddy have quite the history in our industry, there's still really no place for public bashing of any companies in that fashion. But, but uh, a lot of people seem to enjoy it and uh, make it an important pastime of their own. So I'm, I'm well, in my den. I can do whatever I want, right? Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> you can do whatever you want, Kevin. Uh, but. I'm just uh, not a particularly big fan of those kind of people who want to uh, just spread the hate, you know, the hater aid. Not a big fan. So, Carrie Dills put it well, uh, summed up the uh, the issues and the situation with both companies. Uh, so, if you are not sure about what's going down, that'll inform you pretty well. So, Kevin, do you have anything fun to share with us today? Fun? Uh, uh, I've been. I've been crazy, crazy busy the last month, so I, <laughs> I haven't been in a fun place. I've just been too busy, so I, I got to pass on that question. But usually, I would. So, <laughs> sure. All right, that's cool. Well, if that's the case, then what I'd like to do is dive in a little bit to your background. So maybe a lot of people, maybe maybe not, but uh, don't quite know where you come from. And uh, we're going to get to what it is you do in just a minute. But first, let's talk about the younger Kevin Skerritt some years ago. Some years ago. when I Some hit. years ago. Maybe just a couple years ago uh, when you were just getting started with your career or, or maybe just a little bit before that. Yeah. Well, this is my second you... career, actually. Uh, actually, my third or fourth career. <laughs> okay. All right. Before you got started with your first career, what is it that a young Kevin Scarrett really set out to do? Uh, the very young Kevin Scarrett didn't set out really to do much of anything except just get by. But <laughs> I, in, in uh, the, the transition from career to career, from industry to industry, I realized that one of the things that I picked up when I was very young was just this passion for constant learning, just voracious reader and just can't get enough information into my head. And that has served me well over the years. So by the time the internet came along, I'd already been a uh, multiple industry uh, seasoned veteran uh, in my late 30s, early 40s. And I uh, was part owner of a national health and safety company. I had spent time in the uh, environmental consulting world in the laboratories uh, doing electron microscopy and phase contrast microscopy for a handful of years. I was a stockbroker. So what happened when the internet came along, uh, I found that my business experience served me well and my newly acquired skills of design and coding was this beautiful combination of tech and art, which served my my bachelor's degree. Didn't didn't plan on wearing this shirt today, but my bachelor's degree in, in science and my minor in fine art. The internet was just this beautiful combination of technology and art. So when it, it came along, I just gravitated right to it. So that wow. this, in, in what ways were you applying that technology, you know, professionally and academically at the time? Well, I was. Uh, 
part owner of the health and safety company. And when the internet thing came along, when they called it the internet thing, um, this was the same year that Mosaic came out as a browser, so 94. Uh, that's when I built my first website. And by 97, I, I realized that what I was doing was better than most of what I was seeing on the internet, which wasn't really too difficult back in 1997. But uh, the, uh, the fun that I was having doing that, uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a tough decision. It took me a, a couple of weeks to make the decision, but I came home and I told my wife and had, had a, a one-year-old and a three-year-old at the time, and I said, I'm quitting my nice, cushy, six-figure job, honey. I'm going to start in a web development company. <laughs> 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 that didn't go over too well. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was absolutely the best decision and uh, haven't turned back. So wow. and a lot has happened since then, obviously. So a lot I can imagine. Really? So 1997 was a big year for you. You sat on your own for the first time. Right. Yep. And uh, the, it was an agency uh, started out in uh, uh, Brentwood, California, uh, just north of Silicon Valley, just out, outside of Oakland. And uh, because of the, the, the kids, we wanted to get to a place there was less pollution, less traffic, less you know, crime, less, less of a lot of things. And so we uprooted and moved to New Hampshire, of all places. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So clean air, no taxes. And very good for businesses. It was just a stone's throw from Boston. So there's the tech center there. So it, uh, it was a good move for us uh, and uh, started an, an agency called Acorn Creative and uh, built it up nicely over the course of years. And in, in 2008, it was uh, a lot of changes. Don't want to go into all the details, but uh, 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 I made the decision to pull way back and uh, start working home based instead of brick and mortar again. And then uh, uh, almost uh, the same, same employees, a lot of the employees that I had then are, are still subcontractors to me now. So the name changed and the players stayed the same and the services all stayed the same. But over the course of all those years, there were lots of services that were add on, added on above and beyond web development. So. That's really interesting. And so I'm curious, you know, maybe we could walk through some parts just a little slower. You know, when you first got started, uh, that was 19 years ago. Yeah. And uh, it, what was your approach like? How did you acquire new clients? And uh, it, what, would, what did that like onboarding and sales process look like? You know, especially coming yeah. from somebody who was like uh, 10 years old at the time and certainly not thinking about those kinds of things. You weren't? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, I'm sure it was quite different, you know, selling a website right now. Yeah. yeah there's yeah. no, there's no concept of like convincing a client that they actually need a website. Like that's oh, back then it was, everybody knew they needed a website. And it was, by 1997, it was the people who had made the decision. I mean, how, when was the last time you actually ran into someone who did not have a website, like a real company that was serious about business? I, and only startups, only new businesses. Oh, yeah. I, Actually, I just interacted with one last week. Really? Yeah, blown away. I because I, I haven't encountered that in years, years and years. But back in 1997, uh, the the drive was I need a website. Why? Because everybody else has a website, and my competitors all have a website, and I'm being left behind. That was the feeling. Right. So the sales process really was non-existent. And another thing that I learned back then is uh, if you go after a very narrow niche that when you sell within that niche and if that, that uh, sliver of an industry talks amongst themselves, there is an enormous boost in word of mouth marketing. Uh, it just so happened that uh, the first handful of clients that I got were in the employment area. So they were like recruiters and resume writers and career coaches and people like that. And within the first five years of running Acorn Creative, I had uh, designed and built over 30% of the websites in the professional association of resume writers. It's a national organization. And every time there was a conference, Oh, who do you use? Kevin. Oh, who do you use? Kevin. Oh, okay. I guess I'll call Kevin. And so I never had to sell. I, I really didn't have to market because the word of mouth marketing was so, so strong. And that, that lasted probably six or seven years before that started to plateau. 
and I needed to start doing other things. So I had actually had it quite easy from a marketing perspective back then. <laughs> That's truly fantastic. Yeah. An experience that I've not heard many others uh, be able to walk through quite in the same way. Oh, I think it was timing. And the, the first three years from 94 to 97 of building up basic skills on how to build a website, I mean, everything was self-taught. I, you know, I didn't go to school to learn IT or programming or anything having to do with computers. I have, I have a, a minor in fine art, and everything else is self-taught. So school of hard knocks. And, That's uh, fantastic. Yeah. And so back then, the drive was, I need a website. I need a website. The, those that got into the Internet uh, realm early, they learned pretty quickly that, okay, I've got other competitors that are, they have just, their, their websites are just as good and they're being found. And my site doesn't have quite the right feel. It needs to be more professional. And there's this search engine thing that's starting out now. Oh my gosh, you know that, how, how do I, how do I do that thing? So the whole SEO world started to erupt back in the early 2000s. And so those services needed to be added on. So, uh, mm the needs of the client base started driving the adding on of services. And about 10 or 11 years ago, the big change was the, the, the different types of marketing that were being done and the, the needs of the, the clients was driving a stronger push to better marketing and better messaging and better connection to clients and, and better presentation. And that's, that's, was, is really what drove the, the brand strategy process. And so since then, what I've discovered is that the brand strategy really has to start first. And your business partner, Steve and I, are giving a talk in Ann Arbor on the, this exact topic. That, yes, uh, and I'm very excited for that. And yeah. we're going to have to talk about that in just a minute. Sure. You've had, you've had some, uh, you have a unique perspective. So not, I've had a lot of guests on this show, but not, not too many that you know, could say that running an agency and providing these client services and immersing oneself in, in uh, web technology for 20 years, you know, uh, not, or at least in the same way. Um, so I'm curious, uh, your other guests aren't as old as I am. That's basically yeah. what you're saying. <laughs> well, oh. I've had over a hundred guests on the show by now. So we've had every age. You're certainly not the oldest or the youngest. Um, so my question is because, you know, I, I appreciate your perspective on this and, and maybe you'd have a, a, a unique take, but if you look back on the last 20 years of our industry of website development in particular of customers looking for this service and, uh, and selling it and, and the, the discussions that you have and consultations, um, if you were to maybe take these 20 years and, and write a book about it with two or three or four or five or six chapters, uh, breaking up the seasons and the, and the changes and the shifts in this industry that were really significant, you know, what might be the titles of some of those chapters? Um, okay. Uh, in the beginning, it would be, it would be uh, keeping up with the Joneses. And, okay. And I like it. This new technology and, and learning how it benefits to you. It, that, back when people thought that the internet was a fad, those people were being a little bit short-minded or at least not open enough to the possibilities of what it could bring. And, sure, sure. and you know, 1997 through 2000, there was just an enormous amount of that. So the people who really adopted and embraced the change are the ones who benefited the most. So, you know, this is a new world. So there, there would be a, a chapter title there. <laughs> um, and as, as they evolved that uh, you have, those, those clients had to learn more and then learn more, and then learn more. It, it, they, they realize that there's uh, an enormous world of technology. There, there's this, uh, this enormous pool of information that they feel that they need to tap into, um, but it's just way too deep to do it on your own. And, and part of my little sales pitch, is, you know, I'd always ask, you know, do you, do you really want to, you know, kill your own chickens to make chicken soup? Do you want to, you know, make your own? weave your own cloth to make your clothes? No, there's a reason why I'm doing what I'm doing and you're doing what you're doing. That uh, in, usually in the internet, with the internet, and even with the advancement of content management systems and uh, you know, site builders like Wix, 
business owners who are really serious about their business really shouldn't try to be the jack of all trades. And I, that, I think that realization started really to kick in in the early 2000s. And since then, uh, I think a, a, a really good chapter would be it's still about people that regardless of what's happening in the technology, regardless of what happens with uh, new social platforms or, you know, just the advent of social media in, in, in general, um, regardless of all of these issues, your business is still a people to people business and it always has been. And it always will be that the technologies allow us to connect better. It allows us to present ourselves differently. It allows us to uh, connect more frequently in different ways, but it's still people to people. Yeah. Fascinating. So that's awesome. Yeah. Maybe, uh, maybe you should write that book, Kevin. I, I think that's a probably good chapter right there for how yeah. I like it. So uh, let's catch up to where we are today. Tell us a little bit about the current iteration of flock marketing. What does it look like? Uh, it's actually changing again. And um, what's happening is there, uh, the shift uh, with WordPress, I think it's WordPress primarily too. Um, there is a shift that uh, as long as you can get yourself covered with the technology, the, the server side stuff and the, the basics, stuff to get an website built, there's, there's a, a lot of shift back to DIY with content. And that shift where, you know, in 1997, if someone had to cross a T, dot an I, or put in an extra comma, they had to contact me. You know, they, there was very few of my clients who were willing to touch an, a, a web page or, or, oh, God forbid, learn what FTP is. I mean, that's, that, that was just, you got it, that's your job. And, and, but now with, with technology, the whole content creation, uh, contract, content management process, it's all sh shifting back to like a 98% DIY. And because of that, it's freeing us up to do the cooler, funner stuff. Yeah. And uh, with my business, I'm, I'm actually shifting m away from web. And I'm going to start focusing more on brand, more on writing. I'm, I've been working on a book for the last six or seven months and knock on wood, hopefully it will be done by the end of the year. I'm shooting to have it done by the end of the year. And uh, I am working with my youngest son who was the, the, the one year old that I referred to when I started my business uh, is, is now a, a sophomore in college and is a, is quite a skilled programmer. And he and I are working on a couple of apps together. So that's amazing. And it's how exciting. Way fun. <laughs> way fun. Oh my goodness. I can hardly imagine just how cool that would be. So it's one of the things that I always really enjoy talking about is, is and, and I've kind of talked with you about this a little bit before, uh, but I like talk, taking a look at the past and how, uh, what maybe the iterations of a business has been because our, our agency has only really existed for a little over four years at this point. And even in that short span of time has gone through a number of very significant iterations, modifications to our fundamental business model, the services we offer, even our brand. Yeah. So yours, you know, having doing this, having been doing this professionally, you've uh, mentioned two brand names that you've operated under. Mm -hmm. You mentioned right now you're shifting a little bit your focus, your model. Um, talk us through some of the more significant, um, maybe versions of your business mm -hmm. uh, as you look back, and uh, what was the impetus for those changes, um, yeah. and, and what exactly did you change? Yeah, well, uh, it, it, well, starting out in in Silicon Valley, stones throw from Silicon Valley, uh, it was easy. Uh, I was surrounded by resources. You know, the people that I knew there, just people who I ran into daily, they were tech people. And it, it, even in the small town that I lived in, even though there weren't a lot of tech people there, uh, I was connected with tons of people in Silicon Valley. But uh, family, for family reasons, I decided to move away. And uh, you know, the, some of the decisions were, could I move back home to Michigan? Should I go to someplace like, uh, you know, Houston or, uh, you know, Washington or some other tech center, Boston. And so this was a, a very long discussion with my ex-wife and it was the, uh, uh, a random decision, uh, not, not the, this decision wasn't random, but how it happened, it was, it, it kind of appeared random. 
um, there was a article uh, in Fortune magazine that said that Nashua, New Hampshire was the number one place in the United States. And this was in 2001, at, uh, or 2000, 1999 and 2000. It just came out in 2000. So I said, well, we should check that out. And this is right in the middle of when we were trying to decide where we wanted to move. And uh, right after 9-11, a couple weeks after 9-11, uh, we had gone on a cruise, a color cruise that went was supposed to go from New York up to Nova Scotia and back, but it ended up getting moved up to Boston because obvious for obvious reasons, uh, New, New York was not a not settled down yet. And so we were looking watch, looking at New England on this cruise, and we decided just to tack on a couple of days to check out Nashua, and we fell in love with New Hampshire. So I want we wanted to raise our kids in New Hampshire, but we didn't have any family there, no friends there, no connections, and the only requirement that I really had was I had to have a decent internet connection. So this was an enormous change for the company, but it's an internet company. You can live anywhere as long as you have a decent internet connection, right? That's why we're, that's one of the benefits that we're all in this business, right? Yeah. But as I started to grow, I realized that I'm not scalable. So one way of growing your company is to hire employees. So I started doing that and moved into this teeny little office yeah, and uh, it, it was, you know, we, we look at our early, early years and early days and you, you look back and go, wow, I can't believe I did that. It was this hovel of this kind of dingy little place and the apartment next door uh, uh, had a, a Middle Eastern family that loved, loved, loved their food, which, which is great, but it was so overpowering. The smells that would come through the walk, through the, the adjoining door. It was like, oh my gosh, what are we having today? And so I look back on those years, and it's like, wow, that was that was that was quite an office. We moved into better digs and continued to grow. So from two thousand three through two thousand and 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 seven ish, uh, went from one employee up to nine employees, and so had a you know, had a uh, three des three designers. Uh, three to, uh, coders, project manager, secretary. Had, you know, it was, a, it was a full agency and was doing really well. 2008 hit us really hard. That was a, in New Hampshire, um, the economy just completely caved in. And, uh, you know, not to go into too much detail, but it was also going through a divorce at that time. It was just this, you know, colliding of bad things going on. And I said, you know, I'm going to pull back and take some time off. And so... When I closed Acorn Creative, I didn't. I was I, I was damaged goods back then. <laughs> I was damaged yeah. goods in that you can't you can't be employed by someone else if you've been running your own business for you know eight nine years. It's 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 just too hard. Uh, so I was very particular about the the kind of job I would take, and because of the 2008 economy, it wasn't going to be in New Hampshire. You know, I was looking down in Boston. I was looking back in California and looking back in, in Michigan too, where my family is. So the first job offer that I got was uh, the director of new media for uh, an education startup. And they wanted to build a very social media like platform for their, uh, for their company. So I spent about a year and a quarter helping them do that. And, uh, uh, but it was tough. It was really, really tough not being the boss and, and wanting things to go a certain way and, you know, having your decisions be vetoed by the person who actually is in charge. So, so I said, you know what? I think that my entrepreneurial bug is just too strong. I need to start another agency and get back to doing what I, and, and while I was employed, employed, I was still providing service for, for long-standing clients that just, I, I, I felt bad just letting them go. You know, the vast majority of the hundreds of other clients I had to let go, but there was a handful of people who I was still helping out in the evening after hours. So started up the agency again and hit flock marketing. Well, welcome to flock marketing. And that decision was me being back here in Michigan and uh, making the decision to not go brick and mortar, uh, have subcontractors instead of employees be home-based and uh, a lot happier. I think there, there, there are definite struggles there. It's uh, uh, you, you get used to spontaneity and uh, being able to make a request and have it be done with employees where with subcontractors, they may or may not be available right away. And there is that distance working thing that you know, goes away. The, the benefits of working in the next room go away. 
but uh, the challenges are far outweighed by the by the benefit of of uh, flexibility. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So tell so us a little bit, bit Kevin, Kevin. What is branding? What is branding? Uh, how much time do we have? <laughs> uh, well, the confusion comes when people. Uh, there's a phrase that I hate: brand identity because it mixes two ideas together in one phrase, and it's the source of most of the confusion in the industry. So if you take the concept of branding and separate it from the, the concept of identity, identity is the collection of ideas where you are recognized. So the tangible, uh, your, your logo, your tagline, your uh, color palette, your font selection, your, you know, there are, there's a hotel chain, I forget which one it is, that has patented uh, a lemongrass smell that they have in their lobbies. You know, that's part of their identity. You know, uh, Coca-Cola's bottle, the shape of the bottle is a patented part of their identity. So all these tangible bits and bites, primarily the logo and the tagline, those recognizable things are identity. The emotional connection that companies make with their clients, that's the branding. So if you're going to create a great brand, uh, it, that's referring to the emotional connection that you're establishing with your customers. Powerful. Good? Makes sense. Mm -hmm. So, so why is why that such a good question, question to ask? What well, uh, it, it's a it's a good question because most businesses never ask it. Right. So, and, and even if you go all the way from the smallest mom pa company that you've ever met. All, all the way up to the largest uh, enterprise level, multi-gajillion dollar multinational conglomerate that you've ever seen, and everything in between. There, there is this belief that branding is only for the, hi the high-end people or the people who can afford it or the people who have the time and resources to expend on that, that there's, there's not much value that you get or that the process is different. And all of that is not true. Not, n none of that is true. Yeah. Branding is branding is branding. And how you make a connection with your target audience, remember it's a people thing, right? That uh, how uh, Apple connects with people is the same as Sally Sue who sells, sells whirly gigs at the state fair, right? The, the process of connecting with people, now granted Apple's target audience has a lot more money to spend, is global, and they have hundreds of millions of customers where Sally Sue might be trying to target a couple of thousand people within a 10 mile radius, right? So there are, there are, there's are matters of scale with things like the size of the audience and, and uh, gross revenues and things like that, but the process of branding is the same. Uh, and because this emotional connection so dramatically affects everything that you do in business, and I really truly mean everything that you do in business, if you don't do that first, and or if you don't do it well enough, then almost everything in your business seems to be a little bit too hard or it doesn't quite work the way that you thought it would. And the number of people who come to me and they say, yeah, I think I need help with a brochure. I think I need a new website. Or I think I need a new logo. I think I need a new marketing strategy. I think I need to be found on the search engines more often. What they think is usually wrong. And the very first meeting I'll have with a uh, a prospective client as I'll say, okay, uh, that search engine thing, let's just set that aside for a little bit. Let me ask you about your, your company. And really what I'm asking them is how are they trying to connect with people? What is their brand? I, we look at their collateral. We look at all their business documents. We look at all their advertising that they've done. We look at their social platforms. We look at their website and, and talking to them just for, 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, that's really easy to figure out what kind of brand they've tried to establish. If they actually have an, an idea of what that means, uh, where they've just kind of fell on it, or if they're naturals at it, because there are some people who are really great brand strategists just naturally. They feel they have this gut feeling inside of how things should be done. And when they, when they run with that, it serves them well. Other people, they're just all over the place. It's, it's spray and pray marketing and their messaging's all over the place and they're chasing after five different competitors simultaneously. And of course, if you're trying to do five things at once in five different ways, 
your brand's going to be all over the place. So the, the benefit of, the, of asking that question or, um, you know, why is brand important is if you figure out what that is first, then everything that you do that's based on that becomes consistent and powerful. And people who don't do it, no surprise, their, their, their marketing and all of their other business is not as consistent and not as powerful. So always brand first. Kevin, I'm getting an echo uh, for me, but um, my next question is for those of us who are consultants, the agencies, freelancers, us trying to help clients. Mm -hmm. We walk through our process with them all the time, but many of us are, are not really appreciating the brand aspect to the level that you do. What lessons do you have for the rest of us who are serving these clients in a professional way, trying to help them get to the next level, chase these competitors, serve their customers better, and so on? Yeah, uh, well, that's a good question. I, <clears throat> I think to become, uh, well, let me, let me back up. Um, if you talk to a brand strategist, um, and I've talked to many hundreds. I have watched how other people deliver brand strategy services, and I think I've written, I've read about every book that I can get my hands on. I mean, the, the library behind me is just a third of them are on brand strategy. <laughs> um, over the course of about a year and a half, when I, when, I, when I decided to have brand strategy as a service, I dove into it, as a student and I, I, I said, okay, I need to figure this out. I need to find out what it really means before I try to do it on my own. I need to learn a lot. And the reason it took so long is when you read brand strategy books, there are a lot of opinions and there's a lot of information out there that isn't actually true or isn't actually applicable. And, and, and not, when I say that it's not applicable, it's more, um, I'm, I'm going at this at this time with 12 or 15 years of, of web experience and, and 25 years of experience, of business experience. I, I knew how I was as a business person. I knew my hundreds of clients, how they react and how they think. And as I'm reading these books, I'm like, there's just no way I can implement this idea. This, is, this would just be too hard. And when I talk to people about strand, that brand strategy, they, they thought the exact same thing. It's just... It's just too hard. I tried that. We had a brand consultant in here last year and we spent $30,000 and just, it just didn't work for us. And the number of times I've heard that story over and over and over, it was, it saddened me. And so the struggle was, is there a better way? Is there, is there something that uh, someone has figured out where there's this magic, easy, easy path to a great brand strategy? And, and I, and I think I discovered it, but, uh, for people who aren't brand strategists, there is, there, it's the reason why I'm writing the book. Okay, so uh, there is a book that really got me on the right path uh, about eight or nine years ago. Uh, it, the book is called The Hero and the Outlaw. Uh, the authors are Carol Marks and Margaret Pearson. And, I don't know, uh, Margaret Marks and Carol Pearson. And uh, there are two psychologists in Florida, and the book outlines this idea of taking union archetypes, Carl Jung's concepts of the collective unconscious and the ideas of archetypes and applying them to business. And so an archetype is, a, is by definition an idea that's universally understood. So all seven and a half billion people on the planet understand it. It's understood in the same way. So it doesn't matter whether the person's from China or from the United States, they understand that idea the same way and that it's very powerful and it's an emotional idea. It's, in, it's ingrained in us, in, in our DNA, because we're humans. Okay, so if I say the word mother, which is an archetype, I don't really need to say anything else. The instant I say that word, you get what I mean, right? And it's a powerful word, and regardless of what your, your own relationship with it is with your own mother, that idea is a very powerful one, right? So if I take that singular, powerful, universally understood, consistent idea, which is what we want our brands to be, and I apply it to a corporate brand, I'm gonna get something like Campbell's Soup. Makes sense, right? So as soon as I say mother, and I say Campbell's Soup, now 
your opinion about Campbell's Soup's product might be that it's too salty, it's not very nutritious, it's not super high quality. But when you think about the brand, you totally get what they're doing. They're trying to connect with this concept of mother. And everything about their brand does that. Their entire identity, all of their marketing, all of their messaging, all of their collateral, all of their TV ads, everything that they do in marketing is based on this really powerful singular idea. And so this discovery of Jungian archetypes eight, nine years, ten years ago is uh, what started me on the right path of helping customers be better with everything. So uh, as soon as I started doing that, my clients' marketing started becoming better. Their website messaging, the, the copy that they wrote, was much tighter and much more powerful. And how many of your clients do you have where you watch them develop content for the site that you built them, and they're all over the place? And you know they're all over the place. And they're, they're trying one thing one day and something else this other day, and they write too long. And they're, talk, they're always caught in, in a web 101. It's me, me, me. Here's, what, here's everything you need to know about me. Here's everything you know, need to know about my company. Here's all the stuff that you need to know about my products and services. And they never talk about what I'm going to do for you, the customer. It's always me, me, me. And so when, when you teach someone about brand strategy, this, you're going to be this mother. You're, everything you need to write needs to ooze this warmth and, and you know, cozy, cushy, warm and fuzzy feeling. They stop fo focusing on their product. And they start focusing on good brand strategy, the, the messages that evoke those, those emotions. So um, uh, the book started out with 12 basic archetypes. The book that I'm writing is how to take those basic 12 archetypes that Marks and Pearson created, expanding them out, and it's a much more of a how-to process. Of, you know, how do I get from this one singular idea to being a better copywriter? And so really the, to answer your question, how does a web developer become a better brand strategist? You have, to be, you have to start becoming a student of it and start thinking about not only your own business, but your customers' businesses. And if you, uh, if you can connect with someone who gets it in this, in this way, um, you can guide them to that as a resource. You know, I'm, I'm willing to help a lot of people for – for, uh, to get them on the right path to brand strategy. But one of the reasons that I'm writing the book is that I think that uh, the, the decision-making to get from I have no brand strategy to I've made a decision on what archetype that I'm going to use for my, for my company. I'd like to get that to free and within a couple of hours. When I first started it, it was, it was a six, seven, eight-hour process multiple consultations, questionnaires, uh, in-face whiteboarding sessions. It was this long, drawn-out process. I was building a new service into my company's suite of services. But I realized that the faster and the easier that I can make that process, the more successful my clients were. So I kept tightening and tightening and trimming it down. And I've got it down now to where um, I can get someone to making that archetype decision within a couple of hours. Uh, start to finish. And, and once they make that decision, it's amazing how much easier everything else is. The, the design process, the, the content creation process, and they stay on the path, the right path, a lot, lot more often. It, this is so important that if I have a new client come in and they say, uh, can you help me with a website? And I go through my usual process where I say, okay, let's set the website aside. Let's talk about your brand. If after that discussion they, they say, mm, you know, that, that brand thing, I've already done that before. I don't want to, I don't want to look at that. I, don't, you know, I just want you to build a website. I'll pass on the project. It's that powerful. If I, what I've discovered is uh, in the first five or six years of providing brand strategy as a service, I could put my clients into two buckets, those that did brand strategy the right way and those that did it the wrong, the wrong way. And the difference in the success of everything that they do, their profitability, their growth, their ability to create good marketing was so dramatic. The difference between those two groups was so dramatic. I just said, okay, I'm not even going to uh, uh, have my success be associated with your lack of success. So I, I, I'll pass on clients.
effects um, if they if they if they don't if they choose if they opt out of going down the brand strategy route. It's that powerful. So, so say I'm I'm totally buying into the importance of this the okay. brand exercise and the, the archetypes. Say I'm just a, a freelancer or an agency and I, and I want to incorporate this. Mm -hmm. uh, help me get some actions here, some tactics that you've developed over the years of really educating and persuading the client to walk through this process. And knowing, I know that I've had conversations with clients before where they do say things like, well, it, our brand, that's not broken. That's not what we brought you here for. It's fine. And perceiving a brand, you know, a branding exercise is like reinventing the brand, which Right. You have enthusiasm or interest in doing, and I, I try to convince them that it's more of like a, let's let's let make sure we're reflecting the brand the yeah, right way. Or just, yeah. You're going through the exact same thing I did back then, right? So it's hard. It's hard, so especially if they're not using the same lingo. So the first hurdle you have to overcome is that whole brand identity thing. Think, oh, okay, well, if you're referring to your logo and tagline and having a style guide, that's not your brand. That's your identity. So if you think you've got that covered, that's, that's great. You know, I and mean, we can certainly go through each of those pieces and comment on it. But I'm gonna, I'm, I'd, I'd be happy to show you where I don't think that your brand is as powerful as it should be. And, I, and I'll phrase it like that when I really want to say, wow, your brand sucks. <laughs> but I'm not going to actually use those words because I've actually read your homepage. <laughs> right? And it's all about me, 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 and my products and my, my you know, Calls, calls to action to different, on my differentiated, cutting edge leading technology. <laughs> That's blah, 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 right? So it's, they don't get it, they just think that they got it. So, uh, so I'll, I, there are several exercises that I, would, I, I can go through to, to point out to them that, uh, where they realize, well here, let me, let, me, let me give one to you. I don't know if you, I know that Steve's done this, but uh, I don't know, and for your viewers too, the, the, the listeners. Uh, we'll do a three second quiz, okay? You, because the, the, the quiz ends at the end of the question, <laughs> you only have three seconds to think, you can't really try to outthink this and don't try to be cute, just, just do it, right? Just whatever pops into your head, okay? Name a cola, a running shoe, and a fast food. Stop, what did you come up with? Uh, Pepsi, Nike, and Burger King. Pepsi, Nike, and Burger King. You get most people will say uh, McDonald's, uh, Coke, and what did I say? Uh, and uh, Nike, Coke, what? Fast food, McDonald's. Yeah. Uh, Nike, Coke, and McDonald's. Right. So you got one out of three. Okay. Ninety-five percent, and I've done this in, in, in front of rooms of a thousand people, five hundred people, like dozens and dozens and dozens of times. 95% of people will say, will say all three. You're extremely, extremely rare to only get one out of three. Of the other 5%, four of the four percent of them will get two out of three, right? Less than 1% will, will ever get just one. I don't think I've ever met anyone who's ever got zero, right? Hmm. So the question, the, the, the point of the three second quiz is to ask why? Why not Burger King instead of McDonald's? Why do 95%, even if you like Burger King better, most people will still say McDonald's. That's the one that pops into their head. So we're talking about mind share here, not market share. We're not talking about the depth of their marketing or how many marketing dollars they spend each year. We're talking about the quality of the marketing that gets your brain to think that brand first before anyone else. So brand mind share is a really important concept. How many companies do you know of who have 95% mind share? Well, there's three of them right there, right? Which right. is such an inter interesting question. So uh, if I say soup, 95%, we'll say Campbell's, right? So right. If, if brand is the same for the micro businesses as they are for the huge, the huge businesses, then it should hold true all the way down to someone like, uh, you know, a less than five person plumber working in uh, Jackson, right? Sure. So if I draw a 15 mile circle around this person, they, they're only willing to drive 15 miles. 
their target audience is, you know, let's call it 8,000 residences. And they're, they're, let's say they only do residential plumbing. So where Nike is selling shoes to ostensibly everyone who has feet, right? Seven and a half billion people on the planet. This plumber, their market, their target audience is much, much smaller. But how many competitors do they have? Maybe 20, 30, you know, in that same area. Will that plumber have 95% mind share? No way. Is it possible though? And the answer is yes. So for them to get 95% mind share, they have to have really aggressive marketing, really aggressive marketing, and it has to be done in a way that gets people to think about them in a powerful, consistent, emotion-based way. People don't really care about plumbers or plumbing. They don't care about what kind of wrench you use, and they don't care about you know, your hours of operation. Well, they do when it comes time to use them, but they're not gonna connect with you for those, those things, right? They're gonna connect with you on things like, wow, they saved the day, or wow, they really cared, you know, their, their level of customer service, or wow, they were just, they, they did things completely differently. And all these little phrases that I'm saying are based on archetype ideas. So if you create a brand based on a single archetype and you do it really well, over time, that's your brand strategy, over time, more and more and more people will think about you that way. And in time, you can build a 95% market share, mind share. So uh, it applies to everybody from the smallest companies to the biggest. Okay. It's really powerful, Kevin. I appreciate you sharing that and uh, value. That's, that's very valuable information. Some good lessons that I'm taking away here. So uh, we're running uh, mostly out of our time, just a few minutes left, and uh, just a couple of kind of wrap-up questions that I want to go into. Can you uh, look ahead at your calendar for me and just uh, let me know where people might bump into you in person in the coming yeah. year? Uh, here, let me, I know that you asked me to be uh, next Tuesday the 20th. I'm going to be presenting at the Jackson Meetup uh, and then, of course, the, the, um, we have the uh, WordCamp Ann Arbor coming up uh, next month. And uh, I, I'm working on another, uh, another Ann Arbor uh, event here uh, with uh, one of the – I'm a, a, a co-founder of the Michigan Computer Human Interaction Association, and, and uh, the, one of the co-founders, he's asked me to speak at another Ann Arbor event. I don't know all the details on that, but that's coming up here in another couple months as well. So uh, probably the big one would be the, to invite everybody to WordCamp Ann Arbor because that's why they're listening to you right now, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's the place to be. It's the WordCamp of 2016. All right. Uh, what are some of the things you do in your spare time, Kevin? Oh, my gosh. The, the list is crazy long. Um, uh, outdoor person, so skiing and snowboarding and hiking and kayaking and, uh, you know, uh, started playing pickleball a lot because <laughs> it's, wow. it's easier as, as I'm getting older. My knees aren't what they used to be. It's easier than tennis. <laughs> uh. And so uh, uh, lots of outdoor stuff, but a uh, uh, pretty voracious reader. I'm learning to play the mandolin and the upright bass. Wow. Add that onto my piano stuff. And uh, uh, I, I actually consider social media a, a hobby. <laughs> I mean, I, the number of things that I, I do on different platforms, I, I just am totally, totally into it. So if you can check me out at twitter.com slash Skerritt, my last name, and uh, like, and like me, I'll follow you back. <laughs> but um, doing a lot of things there. And uh, uh, the, uh, this whole new gig with my son on app development, that's taking a lot of time, but uh, boy, is it fun. Just a lot of fun. Uh, you know, we, we're all in the, the service world where we, our profitability and our income is, is generally based on how many hours we put in a day. Nothing wrong with that, but I, I'd like to think that I could start to break away from that a bit, you know, get into product-based ideas and info product ideas and apps. Uh, so the, 
the, the business is more, much more scalable beyond the number of hours I put in. So mm. that's very exciting. Yeah. I'm totally with you. And those yeah. are, those are awesome topics that we could talk about a lot, but yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, in, you know, in, in the future, when, you know, as I, as I sell my first dot com uh, multi billion dollar, I, as I become a unicorn, you can call me and invite me back. And <laughs> my my son likes to think that he's going to be a billionaire by the time he's twenty five. I'm like, oh, okay, that's <laughs> you can think that way. You, you should think that way. Shoot that's for the stars, problem. yeah. Just uh, don't. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's got a great mentor. Well, yeah, he's a. Uh, He's quite the wonder too. His his brain is works completely different than mine, and that, that's an interest. That's a whole other topic of uh, something that you really should uh, explore on your program is um, the difference between the millennials who who grew up with computers and my generation and the generation in between. That really that um, if you didn't grow up with computers and if you didn't grow up thinking about uh, things in a very programming web kind of way. It's amazing the differences. It's astounding the differences. And and I watch it with my sons. You know, they the way they think is completely different than me. So, you know, it, it, that was a question that I was um, hoping to talk a little bit about, and maybe you could touch on it fairly briefly. But it, it, you're, you know, kind of in terms of the web technology, a generation ahead of me, mm-hmm. and. Uh, maybe there are things, there are certainly things that someone like in my position and definitely younger than myself uh, would look at someone like yourself and envy, you know, greater depth of experience and um, maybe, it may be a little easier to overcome that uh, impression with clients, that uh, level of respect for your expertise that clients may give and Mm -hmm. and, uh, your reputation and, and your network and your, extensive uh, portfolio of client projects in the past to fall on where someone new starting out has very little to leverage. Mm -hmm. There's a lot to envy someone in your position, but I wonder maybe you could speak to this. Are there things that you look at people just getting started today and envy yourself? Yeah. Oh, I totally envy the the time you have in front of you. Totally envy the time you have in front of you. And I don't, I don't have many regrets at all. I really, I really truly don't have many regrets. And, but, uh, and I think one of the reasons is, uh, remember earlier I said I'm a voracious reader. I'm constantly learning. And that was imparted on me by my dad, uh, you know, who's 86 years old now and is still a voracious reader, still a voracious learner. Uh, and I think I've imparted that on my kids. Um, so I, if it's the one thing that I think that I would tell someone who's younger than me, that if you're not a reader, if you're not a learner, uh, Force yourself. If if you say I just don't like to read, I'm I my immediate response is you're you're not reading the right stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you're not totally jazzed on it. If it doesn't just totally excite you, if you if you're not daily blown away by learning something new, then you're doing it wrong. Because there's just a there is. I wish I had about 14 brains so I could constantly learn all the different things that I would like to learn all at the same time. But it, uh, there's not enough time, and there's there's. Uh, not enough opportunity in the, the number of people who are, who are going into retirement. Now I'm 50, 55 years old. I don't, I probably won't ever retire. And I, the reality is my idea of retirement would be going from 60 hours a week down to like 20 hours a week. I'd be happy, <laughs> but that's not going to happen for at least another 10 more years. Cause I'm having too much fun. And uh, so, uh, but if you, instead of 10 years in front of you, if you had 40 years in front of you, you know, what opportunity do you have to maximize that 40 hours? Uh, and if you're going to try to do that, it has to be based on constantly learning every single day. You have to be just like a sponge soaking up everything that you can get your hands on. Um, I, I think one of the, uh, uh, the basics of my success has been I, I, I'm, not, I'm not a jack of all trades. I think I'm a master of a couple of trades and a jack of all trades with everything else around it, surrounding it. So I'm not a programmer, but I, I know a whole lot about it and I'm you know, fluent in HTML and CSS and can get my way around with JavaScript. I'm not you, but I know enough to be able to talk with you 
and, and a lot of other industries as well and a lot of other aspects. And so it's that learning thing, I think, that it makes, makes your, uh, your career path much more accelerated. So learn, learn, learn. Readers are leaders. <laughs> that's, my wife would say. <laughs> that's perfect. I love it. I love it. And that's, that's really a good way to wrap up. My last, my last uh, couple questions here first off. Do you have any good recommendations of people that I should have on the show in the future? Uh, let me put some thought in that here off the top of my head. Um, uh, I don't, I, I, you know, there's a couple that I can, I can think of, but I don't know if I want to say their names cause they might not want me to, but I can definitely, I can definitely uh, make some inquiries. There's a couple of really, really big ones that you might, want to have on your show so all right yeah so cool be more than happy to pass along a, a referral i appreciate that kevin thank you and before we wrap up is there anything any that you would like to uh share or pitch or just ways to get in contact with you or who should get in contact with you and why uh well, uh, you know, look out for the book. Um, the, uh, the domain will be, well, it's probably not a huge surprise that uh, a, a book about brand archetypes should be at brandarchetypes.com. So yeah. there's, there's, the, there's the name of the book and there's the website. So uh, by the end of the year, hopefully you'll, you'll see something there. And again, I'm, I'm hoping to have the book uh, be free. Yeah, you know, I'll certainly sell hard copies, but... Uh, you know, having it be distributed as free PDF and Kindle and ebook, um, trying to get it out as fast as possible because I think the idea is best if more the more people absorb it. And one of my ideas uh, is to have the book lead to a network. So think about it, and I'll, I'll try to keep this short. If you're a plumber and you're trying to figure out how you want to market your services, if I ask a plumber that question they're probably going to say, well, I'll just take a look at my competitors and see what they're doing. And that seems like a natural thing to do, right? But what if one competitor is trying to be this really dominant person, a dominant force in their industry, another one's trying to be playful and lighthearted and joking, and another is trying to be warm and nurturing? Your five competitors might be completely different brand strategies. And so if you're trying to look at five different ones, it's going to lead you down the wrong path. It's going to lead you to that spray and pray thing, right? So wouldn't it be better if, if you choose to be a jester archetype, wouldn't it be better if there was a network where a whole bunch of jester companies talked about marketing and talked about how they're, they create messaging in their marketing campaigns? And it would be better to network with a law firm who's a jester and a you know, boutique antique shop who's a jester and a flower shop that's a jester. You're going to get more ideas from those people than you are from plumbers. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So creating a network based on archetypes is the idea. That's amazing. It sounds great. I yeah. can't wait until that book comes out and look yeah. forward to reading it myself. Very good. Okay. Kyle, thanks, thanks for having me. Yeah. So uh, at this point, we're uh, about out of time. It's been an awesome hour chatting with you, Kevin. Thank you for taking the time out of your evening to come and join us. And I really look forward to hanging out with you and learning more from you at future in-person meetups and WordCamps. It's a privilege to be located so close that we get to uh, rub shoulders at so many events. Yeah. And I uh, love those uh, with knitted socks on the shelf behind you. Go blue. Yeah. <laughs> Go blue. <laughs> Very good. Awesome. Thanks, Kyle. Thanks a lot.